Dude, I became a monster. I felt like no one wanted me. I felt like a broken boy that had nowhere else to turn. The Lord sort of like, okay, it's time to grow up. And you're not what your parents said. You're not what the world says. You're not what you think you are. I don't know the whole story, but I've, I've glimpsed little pieces that you have kind of a a hard pass that brought you to to a point where you needed Jesus Christ. And I would love to start there. Can I can I get your story up to that point? My dad, you know, really pushed my mom to abort. I mean, he really, really was like, you know, we're not we're not a thing. This was just a one night stand. I don't want a son. I don't. I'm not ready for this. And my mom, you know, thankfully she refused that. Um, I, you know, my mom quit school you know, before the high school and she just, she wasn't educated. You know, my dad was, you know, a Palestinian immigrant who couldn't read or write English, could barely, you know, really articulate his own language um, because of his, you know, the way he grew up. My mom, I, I lived with her for my first, you know, first two years on the, on, on the planet. And it was just reckless. And, you know, she was 19 with, with a, one child already um, and just different men every night drunkenness, food stamps, welfare, um, you know, and, and so at that point, my dad realized, you know, I got to, you know, go to court and get, try to get custody of this kid because he's living in this environment. I got to get him out of there. So five to 10, I was back and forth from mom to dad, mom to dad, dad still had custody, but I was, you know, going back and forth. Then I'd go back to, to my dad and, and, you know, it was no, no better there because there was a little more stability, but it was just neglect. So, you know, I'd go back to my mom. Now she's living in a new neighborhood and it's, you know, one room apartment with, you know, the, the Doberman Pinscher and, you know, she's drunk every night, waking up at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning and we're out running the streets and stealing and getting caught for shoplifting. And, and so finally at 10 years old, my dad comes and gets me. He brings me, brings me back to the house and he's like, you know, we're done with this. You can't go back. And so this is where I moved in with my dad for, for, for good. Fast forward a few more years, you know, I'm 14, I'm starting to hang with some people, I'm getting into smoking weed and drinking on the weekends and partying at friend's house. I was at home, my dad's, you know, freaking out, he's, you know, you know, yelling at me and, you know, doing all the things and we get into this huge fight and I end up calling my mom and I just was like, you know, I'm done with this. I don't want to live here anymore. So... I call her up. I'm like, mom, I'm crying. I, I want to come live with you. I don't want to live here anymore. Dad, dad doesn't stand up for me. doesn't protect me. My stepmother hates me. She treats me like garbage. Long story short, she, she refused me. She oh flat out said, I, I can't, I can't take you. And so I cried and pleaded and begged. And, and I mean, the whole sob, like, I mean, I was, you know, weeping, you know, begging her to take me. And she just, she, she gave me the stiff arm, man. And, and, you know, I remember the last time I talked to her then, she just said, look, I love you. I, I've got to do this. You know, just stay where you are. You're better off there. And so we hung up the phone. And in that, in that moment, I mean, I remember that was a pivotal time in my teenage years where something in me snapped. And I just, I kind of went off the rails and I felt so desperate and hopeless and broken. And I felt like no one wanted me. Um, thank you for all of that. I, I just want to say, man, I'm... So sorry for your childhood. That breaks my heart. I was got really emotional and just it sucks to see ch children or anyone to go through that, especially children. You know, I, I get in, I, I get into uh, to, to starting to deal deal drugs, and um, you know that was something that I I did for for quite a few years, like three four years. I was dealing, and I had no way to like I didn't know how to react, and so you know, so there was a lot of things that I lacked in my life. You know, just how to solve issues. I just would run from issues or I would fight issues or I would, you know, attack or, you know, you know, verbally abuse or whatever, any way that I could. So, so, you know, so over the next few years, moving out, being on my own, dealing the drugs, doing all the things, I got the two year degree from the community college, transferred into a university. Um, and I went, uh, you know, essentially had to start over at 20 years old as a freshman and so, you know, over the next four years, I went through college and partied, drugs. Uh, about two months into the school year, I get a call from um, a friend that I knew from a sorority. And she's like, hey, I got this friend, you know, Jackie, you know, she needs a date for this event for the weekend. Would you be interested? I just lied and said, I have somebody coming to town. I can't do it. So hang up the phone, phone rings, and it's Jackie. Um, and she's like, I normally don't do this, but... I need a date. 
and I was like thinking in my mind, I've never met this girl in my life. And she's like, okay, well, you know, are, are you interested? And I'm like, well, I can't turn you down. So she's like, okay, well, come on over. The party's at this house, the fraternity house. And I go into the house and they go get her. They bring her out and, you know, here's Jackie. And immediately I'm like, this girl is totally out of my league. You know, and we're just every night from there, just talking on the phone, connecting. You know, I, I, I like this girl. I, I want to be serious. So we, you know, we're exclusive. We're dating for the next, you know, the rest of our senior year. It took me about two months before I started cracking and started showing, you know, the real Celine. You know, I couldn't keep that facade on for too long before she started recognizing. Because I was, I was a guy who would get drunk and either get angry or... You know, I'd have mental break. I had breakdowns, but Jackie threw it all, man. She stuck with me and we stayed together. And then at the end of senior year, we graduated and my plan was to move to Florida. And so for two years, I work in the architecture, you know, industry, you know, she's working at the, the university here in Jacksonville and we're just doing life. And so I, I started working out in the gym, met a guy there. He recruited me to do medical sales. So I end up riding around with him. I shadow him. I see the job. I'm like, I think I can do this. So I take the leap of faith, I quit my job and I start working in sales. And immediately I am like the top rep the first month because I'm very driven. Um, you know, he told me if you do X, Y, Z, you're going to make this. And when I saw that ticket, I was like, I'm going to get that. So I, I took this job and never turned back for the next five years. I worked for him and made insane money. All of a sudden you give a, a person who doesn't have a lot of money, who didn't have a lot of money, who grew up in poverty, you know, six figures and more and more and more. I, dude, I became a monster. So within a year, two years, I, 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 I you know, within the, by the next year, we, we get married. So I got engaged. I, you know, kind of put all that on the back burner, this whole idea of, you know, not being enough. And now I'm making money. So I'm like, hey, well, I can be the husband now. I got this money. We're going to do this thing. I'm going to buy all this stuff. I, I, like, look at me, I'm a success. And so we get married within six, nine months. Like we're in, we're in counseling and the, the lady's telling me, the counselor, we went to some secular counselor and she's just like, dude, if you don't change your habits, you're going to be divorced in like a, you know, six months. Like this girl's not going to stick around. I began smoking weed again. Now I'm buying ounces of weed and, you know, $400 an ounce. And I'm, you know, smoking the good stuff every single night, smoking myself to sleep. And then I'd go to work all day. I'd come home and I'd smoke all the way until 9 PM and I'd pass out. And then I'd wake up and do that every day for the next four or five years of my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was my rhythm. So meanwhile, my wife on the back burner, I'm not loving her. I'm not appreciating her. I'm not respecting her. I'm out living my best life. And she's just like, dude, I'm trying to grow up. Three days later, my wife comes in, she puts a pregnancy test in front of me. She says, I'm pregnant with our first child. I remember thinking, wow, you know, this was almost like a moment where I felt the, the Lord sort of like, okay, like it's time to grow up. It's time to get your life together. She's like, let's go to church. And I'm like, go to church. I'm like thinking, man, like I'm still dabbling in sin. I told her I quit smoking weed, but I'm going off, sneaking off to friend's house and getting high. And I'm just still this, this train wreck. So I went to church it was one of those Holy Spirit moments where you know the Holy Spirit just shoots you straight into your heart. And I remember leaving there so broken. So then the next couple months, stirring, running, you know, the Lord, I believe, is pursuing me. The Holy Spirit is convicting my heart. I'm, I think the Lord is, is now at this point opened my eyes to my sinfulness, feeling broken. The story doesn't end there. I mean, what, what do you do at this point? What, what changes did you make? I'll never forget it. And in the, at this moment on January 1, 2013, when I woke up, I didn't know what was going on. To this day, right today, I know what was going on. The Holy Spirit awakened my heart. The Lord showed up into my life re and rescued me. I felt like a, like a broken boy that had nowhere else to turn. I was in a pit and I couldn't get out of the pit. I no longer wanted to deal with my past. I was tired of running. I was tired of faking. I was tired of being this disgenuine person, putting on a facade. I no longer could put it on because everything that I had to cover up all of the brokenness was, was ripped away from me. I had this six month old son who I'm looking at this little baby and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to be divorced. Like I'm not going to have like, like I deserve poverty. I deserve brokenness. I deserve divorce. I deserve all these things. Yet the Lord stood in front of me 
saying you're not what your parents said, you're not what the world says, you're not what you think you are. You are my, you're mine. I paid, I paid the ultimate price for your life and I can change you. 